Hi guys and welcome. This is Jen Gata Siciliano, artist, memoir writer, bipolar psychiatric survivor, and your host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast, the place that offers an alternative perspective on mental illness, highlighting creativity, non-conventional healing, and breaking on through to the other side. If you are ready for a new narrative on the mental realm that celebrates crazy and cool without penalty, then Not As Crazy As You Think is for you. Hello, this is Jen Gata Siciliano, your host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast. Today, I want to address the increasing um, movement that's going on right now with the um, psychiatric survivor movement. And it's like a light at the end of a long, dark tunnel of decades of hoping that one day we would all come together. And I will say that many of us did come together after the pandemic or through the pandemic. It was a way for us to find each other. I know personally for me, a lot of people who once were out in the public doing things like public speaking and and talks about this kind of thing, they ended up bringing it to the Zoom room. So a lot of these panel discussions that allowed me to learn that there are many people also who are in the mental health community as professionals who are also fighting for the rights of people who consider themselves in the prescribed harm camp. I mean, it's like a new day. Now, obviously, there's going to be a pushback because in the prescribed harm movement gaining more attention... The only way for us to get respect is for us to expose the wrongs of of psychiatry. I mean, this is really what we're about, okay? We're exposing the wrongs of psychiatry. Now, am I attacking every person who's in the field? Of course not. Many people who go into psychiatry, yes, they they care and they want to help people with mental health problems maybe, okay? But the fact that many psychiatrists are so personally offended by people who are critical of their profession it should be a wake-up call to anybody who's looking to get help for mental illness because it's not about preserving a profession. It's about helping people. Things change all the time. Real science actually changes, okay? And they are consistently updating and admitting if they're wrong, if, if new evidence presents itself. So much evidence has presented itself. Since Robert Whitaker wrote his book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, in 2010, it's given people voice all of these years prior to this. So many people were trapped. We had nothing to go on. We had nothing to go on but our intuition that something wasn't right, that what they were telling us about our brains, about our inability to ever heal, didn't make any sense, especially to me since I was healing. But And every day that went by, I healed more. But they always gave credit to their medications. And frankly, those meds destroyed my life. It's been a year and a half now that I've been tapering. And it's been such a wonderful road of reclaiming my mind, remembering who I was, feeling things again. Nobody should be stripped of of something that makes us just basically human and just you know, told that they're incapable. And the beauty of it was, I knew that this was incorrect because I was such a successful young person. I was, you know, top of my class all throughout high school and college. You know, having had so much positive encouragement from teachers, from uh, mentors, thinking that I was just, I had so much promise and so much potential. And then within one experience that was a very traumatic experience that they never looked at, I said, okay, well, they don't deal with trauma. So obviously I need something trauma related, but they were like, no, no, no. We know what's wrong with you. This is what's going to take care of it. And you can never really, you have to give up all your dreams. And I was 22. Okay. Now, this story I've told many, many times and in many, many different ways, but there's still so many people that need to tell their stories because we aren't taken as seriously as mental health professionals. 
There's a recent there's a, there was a recent article put out on October 21st by Heather Loeb uh, called Lessons Learned, Embracing Treatment and Finding Acceptance. And it was on NAMI's uh, website. And I feel for her because she's mentioning things in the experience of getting labeled, of being told that she couldn't be cured, that she just needed to manage her symptoms and find balance within their treatment program, she was starting to rely heavily on ECT. She writes, I would take my medication and go to therapy, but any sign of a bad mood left me wanting more ECT. So yes, ECT can fix something, you know, in the moment, but long lasting, the long lasting effects can be negative and it's a risk. It's such a risk. I mean, we, we do know that you lose memory permanently in many of experiences with ECT. And the therapist told her that, listen, you can't get ECT every time you have a bad day. She realized she had to do the work. It was hard. And she said, I struggled to sit with uncomfortable emotions. Now, I think this is like the crux of it because bottom line is life is hard. Okay. That's the conversation that we need to start having. What she does write, Heather Loeb, is that um, she finds comfort in knowing she's not alone. In 2020, an estimated 14.2 million adults in the U.S. dealt with a serious mental illness, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH. But you need to find the right kind of help. And this is where I have the problem, because there is no ending of the stigma with that language, the right kind of help. Everyone needs to find something to help them cope, to help them get through, to help them manage in this world. Everybody, every single person alive needs to find their mental health toolkit. And that's something that we should be talking about. Okay, that's the kind of thing that needs to be talked about. Because I don't particularly like having to be told that there's only one way to treat me and one way to look at it when I know better. I know better. And I always knew better. In my 20s, even when I was struggling, I knew what they were saying and doing didn't make any sense. But I was stuck and I was forced. There's nothing worse than having free agency taken away from you. Nothing. Especially at that age when you're told that you can do, you know, the, the whole, your whole life is ahead of you, right? That's what I was told up until that point. And then it was like, no, stop dreaming. Um, it's craziness is what it is. And because I, I then was unable to speak and I had no real ability to access my deeper cognition levels, they just became so foggy and I wasn't able to formulate thoughts in my head because of those meds and then then have my own opinion about it and then allow that to formulate sentences and, and speak that through. All those things were taken away from me in the name of mental health, long-term mental health. Again, these drugs are now known to not work after eight weeks. So how is it that that's the right type of help? If you go in before a psychiatrist and you shun this treatment away after they label you, not only are you consider non-compliant, you, you could have a worse uh, mental illness symptom, which would be anosognosia, okay, which is the technical term for lacking insight. Now, anosognosia refers to unawareness of illness. OK, so if you don't believe in their system, if you don't believe in their categorical system that this is the thing that you have, that you have this illness in your brain, you are also even further mentally ill. As happy and successful and healthy and thriving and uh, adjusted and everything that I am right now as I continually taper, anybody in psychiatry would just look at me and say, well, you have anosognosia. You don't believe you have bipolar disorder. And it's like, come on. Okay. First of all, again, for anybody who doesn't understand the uh, DSM, there are wonderful books out right now. And yes, they are highly critical, but they're the first of their kind. So um, everyone should take a look at them. Cracked the Unhappy Truth About Psychiatry came out in 2014 by James Davies. 
amazing. What an expose about how basically psychiatry that he puts forward find in wonderful hidden findings that show that psychiatry is really based around money. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, I mean, let's, let's face it. There is no, nothing else. If you don't want to take drugs, you don't go to a psychiatrist. Okay. So that's where the money is in psychopharmacology. So I want to talk about just quickly the anazognosia thing because I actually came across this um, podcast, which is pretty cool. It's called Inside Bipolar Podcast, and it's with Gabe Howard, who is, he says, living with bipolar disorder. I would just say he's a bipolar type, you know, like not, you're not living with any disorder. You're living with yourself as Gabe Howard, okay? And then there's um, Dr. Nicole Washington. I guess she's kind of like, you know, the legit uh, because she's the doctor and the psychiatrist and, you know, uh, she's she's pretty cool, but she buys into it 100 percent. I mean, she even as much as not that's not known about the biology of mental illness, she's convinced that it's biological. So, you know, I don't know if she's not doing her research or or she's just, again, bought in. And I guess you have to be bought in to the philosophy to stay in psychiatry. Otherwise, you'd be criticizing it. I mean, there's no two ways about it. But they do talk about this anazognosia thing, and I think it's interesting because it is something that comes up all the time when you're faced um, in front of them. You know, again, possibly if you're in an unfortunate situation where you're inside that hospital again in the emergency room waiting to go in, which I've been several times and it's terrible. Um, Gabe Howard said back in 2003 um, the word became started coming up when the Treatment Advocacy Center decided that, hey, you're having trouble with a mentally ill loved one? Then, you know, let's just tag them with this and then it takes away your rights. And this absolutely happened to me. I mean, uh, if you look at my files within that, that 2017 one, St. Patty's Day, very, very telling experience that I had. Again, first chapter of my book, it's... Um, it was unbelievable how basically everything I said was twisted and they weren't listening. They were just looking for something that they could write down to support why they were putting me away. All you have to say is that I have a, I have a lack of insight and then you take away my, my rights. And that's exactly what, exactly what happened. And it is still going on in New York. He said, oh, maybe it's not going on in New York anymore. It is still going on in New York. Okay. It doesn't go away. It's medical, right? It's medical, you know. So basically, anazognosia comes from things like strokes and um, head injuries, head trauma, where you don't realize that you have a, a, a problem, obviously, right? Um, and so it comes from that. And then naturally, they extended it to uh, talk about mental illness. You know, isn't that, isn't that perfect? You know, and Gabe was saying that he's not, he's not uh, crazy about this idea. It rubbed him the wrong way. And the fact that it's taken from a different area of medicine and then applied to mental illness, you know. And then Dr. Nicole says, we do all that. We do that all the time. I mean, we do that all the time. And I'm constantly jumping up and down saying, let's treat mental illness like a brain disease and not a behavioral disorder. Because I hate that when we call it behavioral health. Let's treat it like it is a brain disease. And if that's the case, then it's okay to take something from the neurology world the world of brain trauma and strokes and apply it to mental illness because we are saying it is a brain disorder. So I don't know why that's problematic. Okay, this is exactly why it's problematic because you want to jump up and down and say brain disorder, brain disorder. This is exactly the problem. And not only that, the fact that you guys believe brain disorders, you can't heal from brain disorders. Well, that's really where the problem is because we know that there's neuroplasticity in the brain except for mentally ill people, right? doesn't make any sense. And so Gabe was saying, well, how do you know when a person doesn't need this kind of involvement? So they give you that label, right? Oh, the person has lack of insight. They don't know that there's something wrong with them. And then they put you away. And then that stays on your record. There's no real understanding that there's going to be any removal of that. So as you can see, it's not medical. But because, you know, they haven't found other things to put money behind, those things haven't been supported. But there's plenty of things that can heal you. 
So again, if they looked at me and they saw my success today, they wouldn't say, oh, great, you're healing from mental illness. They would say, you have anazognosia. You don't realize you have an illness. <laughs> I'm not going to you with problems. Yes, but you still have a problem. Okay, because you don't believe that what we say is your problem is your problem. This is essentially the issue. Okay, my insight beyond that of you earning a good living, okay, you sticking to the story because you want to earn a good living, my insight comes from my personal experience. This is a great quote that I, I just came across uh, recently with Michael J. Fox, our beloved Michael J. Fox, right? I thought it was really beautiful that I came for him. He said, this message is so simple, yet it gets forgotten. The people living with the condition are the experts, period. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Michael J. Fox. We're the experts. You should be asking us questions. I was always thinking to myself, why isn't anybody asking me questions about this, this mind of mine if they're so confused, okay? People who are coming forward are speaking the truth, and it's a growing truth for many. And the reason why it's increasing is because we're, we're seeing more and more people get involved with the system. And thank goodness there, there is more vocal uh, movement. Now, remember, in 1994, when I was diagnosed, nobody was on the Internet. Nobody was on. There's no social media. There was no nothing. OK, no phones. We didn't know what to do. We just had to live with it. But now that there's a movement of support, that's where we can start moving with this. An op-ed that came out on June 14th this year of the Los Angeles Times, she writes uh, in the For Your Mind section, I received six psychiatric diagnoses in 25 years. They were a dead end. By Sarah Fay, a mental health advocate and author of Pathological, The True Story of Six Misdiagnoses. Looking forward to looking at that one. And she says, before I attributed all my distressing thoughts, painful emotions, and undesirable behaviors to my diagnosis, I saw them as proof that something was wrong with my brain. Now I see them as part of me and being human. Remarkably, this has lessened my symptoms. Okay, so this is the heart of it. What we're trying to say as psychiatric survivors is we have a story to tell. There's a different way to look at it, and we want to be acknowledged. Now, I've been going to a lot of seminars that explore anti-colonialism in mental health, okay? And this is, I think, where we need to understand and, and go towards. We're so willing to get fixed. We're so willing to believe in the doctors that a lot of us just put up with what is delivered to us. But the thing is, it came out of a colonial system. OK, there was one way, right way to do things, the, the, the right white way, right, the right white male way. That was the way to do things. And if you didn't do it like that, you were just going to be put in some kind of category. But we need to, to think new thoughts on these ideas. OK, this is a great tweet from Dr. Roger McFillin. I like to push him forward every now and then. He was on the podcast uh, this past season, episode four. He just wrote a good tweet. If you think your mood is some biological disease, then you won't be focused on your shitty job, standard of living, poor diet, how the government is provoking fear, the media, consumerism, higher costs, deteriorating relationships, or other real problems. Now take your meds. Now, this is the whole thing. In an article called Psychiatric Power, Personal View by Pat Bracken, in the International Journal of Psychiatry and Medicine, came out in January um, 2012, but he said it is time that we learned how to talk to them, meaning the international, uh, growing international movement that's describing um, discontent. Um, he mentions this emerging international service user movement, um, and he says that he believes it presents the greatest challenge to psychiatry, but also the greatest opportunity. Okay. He said, as it becomes more organized and influential, this movement is starting to play a major role in shaping the sort of questions that are being asked about mental health services and their priorities. Yet there is a limited reflection in our profession about how we as doctors might engage positively with it. 
It seems that while we are comfortable working with individuals and organizations who accept the medical framing of mental problems, we are less willing to contemplate working with critical service users. These are people who reject the medical model because they feel harmed by a system that describes their problems using the language of psychopathology. If we are serious about having an inclusive debate on mental health, we will have to overcome this impasse. We need to entertain the idea that people who reject the medical framing of their problems are nevertheless legitimate stakeholders. It is time that we learned how to talk to them and to listen to their ideas. The user movement with its substantial critical component is not going away. Yes, this is absolutely the case. Um, we aren't going away. We are growing. And <laughs> it's 10 years ago that he wrote that. A lot has happened. A lot of books have come out these last 10 years that have done an enormously beautiful job uh, journalistically of presenting the other perspective. And I am humbled by it because, you know, I've been writing my story, personal story for a long time. And to come across all of this uh, wonderful evidence that that's what's proving to me that I'm not crazy. You know, the the movement, the the collective unified force that's saying, wait, 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 stop moving forward. We have something else to say about our own minds. There are a lot of people who are highly critical of us critics. And I do want to bring attention to an article that was just published on Mad in America's website by Charlotte Taylor Page on September 3rd. And it's called Top 10 Myths About the Critics of Psychiatry. She actually um, interviewed a great many wonderful critics. She spoke with Dr. Lucy Johnston, uh, James Barnes, Professor Peter Kinderman, Joe Watson, Professor John Reed, he's very active, uh, Dr. Sammy Tamimi, and several others, okay, who are vocal. And, and a lot of these critics of psychiatry are professionals. Finally, finally, finally. I mean, I can't stress this enough. We've been waiting a very long time for this. And for anybody to think, let me just say this straight out, anyone who wants to be on psych meds, God bless. If it works for you, fine. But I'm going to say the same thing. If if a glass of wine works for you, fine. If a joint works for you every night, fine. Because that's what it is. It's a drug. Okay? And that's fine. But when I tell you that how many millions of people are disabled, are left completely disabled because of these drugs, and I can use my own life as evidence because in my 20s, I was a mess on these drugs. Okay, there, there was no reason for them to, to think that I needed this kind of heavy medication. It was ridiculous. And they wouldn't listen to me. Why? Because of their philosophy on, uh, of what the mental illness actually is. But she brings up, she asks these questions, you know, do you really believe that mental illness exists? Yes, of course we do. All right. Otherwise, <laughs> No one would be in services if we didn't think, you know, it was real what we were experiencing, right? So, um, and basically, we're not looking to police the link. She says, well, if it's not, if it's just distress and not a disorder, were you just looking at police language? No, no, no. It's not that we're just looking at police language, okay? We're using language to describe things. And if they're using language to describe it as much as they have, so that we can use medical terminology, we are now trying to build a new language and a new philosophy using humane terminology, okay? Now, some people do find that having a diagnosis helps them feel good about, you know, where they are. And the diagnosis-based explanation of suffering and distress is totally embedded in the services, the media, and, and everyone's brainwashed minds, okay? The critics are concerned that the unquestioned use of terms like mental illness and disorder leads to views that shut down other possibilities. And this is a fact because, you know, some of my closest friends, they who believe in science, they would talk to me as though they were teaching me something about my own brain. 
you know, well, you have a chemical imbalance. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. You're, you're reciting. You're reciting what they told you to believe. Now, finally, all these years later, they just proved it this summer. And now we could, we could speak out. I knew this two decades ago, two and a half decades ago. I knew this. So because I didn't have the proof, right? I had the proof of my own heart and my own brain and my own sense, my own good sense that said this didn't make sense. And this is what it is. If we continue going down the path where only certain things are allowed to be vocalized because of what science tells you is real, that's a problem, okay? That's a problem because then it's becoming, a, again, about a unquestionable authority. We forgot what it was like when the Catholic Church was in charge. You know, we want this again, unquestioned uh, authorities, especially when there's no evidence. We are not offered any choice of language when we're offered services. OK, and the first thing we're told is that we have lack of insight if we don't agree with their um, medical view. So many of us now want to use the different language. We want to use hearing voices, extreme distress or low mood, okay, instead of these particular, their particular medical model. Unfortunately, because this is so all-encompassing, this diagnosis and, and the way things are dealt with, um, services are basically built upon diagnoses. And that's the case in schools and whatnot. But what we say is, listen, we want a better alternative, a more humane model. And there are non-medical ways to understand these experiences and to treat them. Those should be offered as an alternative and discussed. Even though we know that the DSM categories aren't scientifically valid, that seems to be an overriding um, admission right now. They're not really scientifically valid, but we still have to go by them. So what you're presenting to the person who starts to become aware of this dichotomy is that you need to just accept that there's something wrong with you, even if they have no evidence of it. And one day they'll come up with it. OK, and in the meantime, you have to take this uh, aggressive treatment, put things inside of your body that can't be stopped. OK, this isn't an easy process. Tapering advice is never offered. OK, it is a violation of human rights, people. For people who want to take the psych meds, I, I have tons of friends and family who, who, who do this. It's totally I'm not judging them. Everyone's looking to alleviate their symptomatic experience, okay? But just know that's what it is. The beauty of it now that they did this study and that it came out was that you could say, okay, well, it's not a chemical imbalance. Like I could literally say that and point to a study. That's beautiful, okay? Because I've been saying that for a very long time and everyone's just like, mm, yeah, she doesn't really know her brain. Sometimes biology is involved. It could be hormonal balance. It could be problems with allergies. And I've said this before, but... Just because biology is involved, it doesn't mean it's an illness or a disorder where the, they assume that the main cause is malfunctioning, okay? And that's the thing that's disrupting the person's life rather than all of these other things that could be in the environment or outside of one's control. Instead of asking what's wrong with me, ask what's happened to me, okay? That's a biggie. Because it talks about the social, the relational, the cultural, the political, etc. All of these other things that can potentially be coloring the experience and contributing to the uh, distress. See, people don't want to look at the social systems. And particularly in America, because we don't have a socialism here, we have capitalism. These structures are very violent, okay, to people who are poor who um, can't get out of, of their situation, if they had proper medical care or comfort or financial support or social services and have a more balanced mental health, things would be easier. But because of that, you know, we then say that there's something wrong with their, their, their genes or, you know, this idea of defective genes, this idea of um, there's something inherently flawed in you. These are the ideas that have 
historically been things that have spurred on very negative consequences, right? Eugenics in the early part of this uh, uh, of last century in America, which actually then encouraged uh, Hitler. And again, if you don't know this, I have a few uh, episodes on this kind of stuff you can look at. And this is what bothers me most that we're anti-science. The fact is that we actually respect science and we're sick of other people disrespecting science, okay? So we want it to be more clear that it's not science so that you're not muddying up what is actually science and what isn't. So much of the dominant biomedical mental health care runs counter to science and is not in fact supported by evidence. If a person does not want this treatment, they shouldn't be forced. Okay, this is my biggest thing. I could have gotten my life back so many decades ago. I never um, believed in this treatment. I never believed in this philosophy. But because they wanted control and they wanted to say what was real and what wasn't real, they told me that I needed to just accept my illness. And again and again, I was re-traumatized. I was actually disabled by and, and made more mentally unwell because of their constant need to be right. So let's look at some of the recent science that uh, now, you know, they're, they're, they make these claims, these, these broad claims. Listen to this one. This claim, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder may be detectable years before illnesses begin. Now, this was the result of one study I came across on neurosciencenews.com. It was a longitudinal study of all people born in Finland in 1987, okay? And it's in the, world, it's in the journal World Psychiatry, um, October 21st, uh, 22, you can, you can find the date. They say that schizophrenia and bipolar disorder typically emerge later in early adulthood, but they found that half of the individuals who developed these illnesses had come to the child and adolescent mental health services, okay, in their childhood. So they say, well, you know, these things could have been treated then, right? Because this evidence shows that there is more of a risk for these kids to develop something later in life. That could be something that you can say, but to say that it's detectable, you know, years before it began, how so? Because you show up? Now, another interesting article from neurosciencenews.com speaking about how a child's birth weight could determine their risk of being diagnosed with a mental health disorder later in life. This is what I'm saying, people. This is the science that's being done. Okay, they start off with saying, okay, we know we're right about this, so let's try to prove it. So these are all the people with mental health disorders. Let's go back and look at what birth weights they had, okay? And then they go back, and then they say, oh, look at the link. So the link is causality. This is not real, guys, okay? Children of low birth weight may benefit from psychological assessments in childhood childhood and early intervention for mental health symptoms if detected to help minimize the burden of mental illness later in adolescence and adulthood. And it's just been published in Research on Child and Adolescent Psychopathology. So the study basically examined birth weights and subsequent mental health in thousands of children in Ireland. Again, this idea that they could take something from Ireland, Finland, or remember, all white countries, okay, dealing with their own levels of, of stress and, and um, culture, and then just say that this is something that we can say about everyone everywhere in the world. This is universal. This is how this stuff is done. Another one from Slate in the State of Mind section, uh, written by Grace Huckins in, on September 13th this year. Could brain scans bring psychiatry into the 21st century? Now, I don't know how that's going to be possible since there are no psychiatric biomarkers for such things. So since the birth of the fMRI, which they can map out different regions of their brains before operating, since the invention, scientists have been scanning mentally ill brains, trying to figure out what's different about them. They say that there are some things that are robust, that there are differences, but you can't diagnose someone with a brain scan, okay? 
And and that's what people have to realize. This isn't those diagnoses are just so that they can start a treatment journey. Okay, it's not something that can then be, um, you know, they they discover the problem, then they have this exact thing like like insulin for your diabetes. This is something that they would always bring up, and I'm sure that they're still using this example. So you know, they don't really they nothing is tied necessarily like one area to this particular illness, one area to this particular illness. Yes, they see activity changing in different ways, but there's nothing that they could really do in terms of diagnosis. One thing doesn't lead to a definitive um, discovery. And basically, that's not the way diagnoses work. Okay, diagnoses work so that you can have a conversation with your psychiatrist about what this thing is in your life. And if we were more honest about that and stop looking in in the areas of neuroscience to to describe psychiatry, we might be better off. In SciTech Daily on October 20th, here's here's an article. Adult brain structure is not fixed. Scientists discover depression treatment increases brain connectivity. Now, I particularly like this one because what this says, okay, scientists in Germany studied 109 patients with serious depression and compared them with 55 healthy controls. Participants' brains were scanned using an MRI scanner that had been set up to identify which parts of the brain were communicating with other parts as a way of measuring the level of connections within the brain. Now, the patients were treated for depression. Some were given ECT, some were given psychological therapy, and some were given medication, some in a combination of all therapies. What they found was that treatment for depression changed the infrastructure of the brain, which goes against previous expectations, they said. Treated patients showed a greater number of connections than they had shown before treatment. But, and here's the biggest but yet, I love this. This is science, right? Discovering. We found these changes took place over a period of only around six weeks. We were surprised at the speed of the response. We don't have any explanation as to how these changes take place or why they should happen with such different forms of treatment. In other words, they happened with all of the treatment options. So Dr. Eric Ruhi from the Netherlands stated, the fact that the observed changes over time cannot be associated with a form of treatment is a pity. But I think it's wonderful. I mean, naturally, they can't tell you, like, because of this, it's, it's inconclusive, right? They can't say, well, this one works better than that. But that's the whole darn point. That's the point. So that science actually is now proving what I'm trying to say, which is healing from mental illness is a personal journey. And it takes just making that first step. And it's different for everyone. Now, I think that we could all agree that there are some things that are just more like wholesomely better for you. And there's other things that are just going to be detrimental to you. So if we could kind of agree upon which of those things are the case, then that's great. And there are many, many ways to treat these things. I just want there to be more transparency with the fact that psychiatry is not the only treatment, okay? It's about reducing the harm. It's about reducing the harm. How harmed are you going to be by these site drugs one day? Or is it better to find a way without those things so that you don't have to worry about tapering at some point? Because that's a reality. Otherwise, you're going to be taking them for the rest of your life. You can't just stop them, okay? You can't just stop them. Yes, a diagnosis. Some people might feel a diagnosis is is okay. You know, now they've given me language. All right. That's what we all need. We do need some kind of a language, but we could talk about these things and say, yeah, you know, what are the things that you go through? I go through something similar, but it's language that's non-medical. Okay. That's what I'm pushing for. 
because the bottom line is if you don't agree with their point of view, you lack insight OK, and and unfortunately, if you don't agree with this morbid change in your personality, OK, now you have a disease which depends on culture, race, ethnicity, faith, all of these things, OK, that are really coloring the interpretation of what the psychiatrist is is seeing as your problem. Basically, do you lack insight? Insight is essentially the degree to which a person agrees with is his or her doctor's uh, interpretation of their mind. And this lack of insight can get you institutionalized, okay? And this is what I'm saying. This is dangerous stuff. I mean, I was terrified to come out with a podcast because I said to myself, oh my God, you know, what if they 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 could identify me and, and break down my door and and and, you know... And somebody might say, well, you're being paranoid. And I'm thinking, no, that's happened, actually, you know, like because of lack of insight, this idea. Psychiatry is influenced by the fashions of culture, OK, and the styles of which are things that are acceptable and that aren't acceptable. And you know what? Now that I have more and more let go of the, the illness story, I can write my new story. There's nothing better than that. Whose story should be the authoritative story of my life? These long-term studies aren't taking into account that this, the, the actual conversation is changing and what mental illness actually is. There's this thing called the looping effect, too. When a diagnosis becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, and I was always afraid of that because I always had such high hopes for who I was and what I could contribute to the world. And the way that they were telling me that I wasn't able to do that, I said to myself, if I believe them, I am going to fulfill this. And so I am going, I have nothing to lose by doubting that they're right about me. And thank God, thank God I, I stuck to that. Uh, on August 18th of this year, New York Post wrote an article uh, by Brooke Cato. Majority of college students have a mental illness study. Now, you know, come on. Okay? It doesn't, that, that clearly doesn't make sense, right? But this is what's happening, okay? And if you look at it like that, Everyone has a mental illness. That doesn't make sense because how can everybody just be ill? But if you look at it as this is about human, the human experience, right? That sometimes you're going to be sad and sometimes you're going to be mad and sometimes it's going to be extreme and sometimes you're not going to know how to control it. And, and let's figure out ways to cope every day and whatnot. Then it becomes a story about the human condition. And if we use that language, then it's not about oh, you know, there's a rise in, in mental illness. It's saying college students, you know, experience an enormous amount of stress. And let's see, let's figure out social systems that can help them. Until we start reevaluating what those things are, we're never going to move forward. But I think we are moving in that direction. In its growing punitive treatments and unwavering commitment to biological theories, the field of psychiatry excludes the most important things in life. Finding one's purpose and meaning through finding out why we were born. Write the story of your own life, okay? Figure out what makes sense to you. What is your purpose? What is the meaning that you give these episodes that occur in your life? Why were you born? And what are you here to do? Connect with that higher self. Connect with the deeper self. And trust that your story about your own life is a lot more valid and probably a hell of a lot more interesting. Thanks for listening to Not As Crazy As You Think. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And remember, mental health is attainable for anyone, especially those labeled with mental illness. Until next time, peace out.